All right, the other Adam. Adam and Adam versus the man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Adam House, longtime friend of mine, Army veteran, but I won't hold that against him. Also, combat veteran, <laughs> who I got to know through combat veterans for Ron Paul. We've been involved in a bunch of different activism together over the years. He's been uh, a visitor here at Gardenia in the Garden of Freedom yeah. and taught some Muay Thai classes out here. But now he's here to plug a book and uh, everything else he's got going on. Uh, Adam, it's it's always great to have you on the show. How you been, brother? Good, good. Thanks for having me, Adam. You know, uh, it's an it's an honor to be on your show again after all these years. You know, I've always appreciated your friendship, and uh, and you know, I, I've got to mention he, while we're here. Uh, although I believe Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen are really holding it down and and doing a good job representing the Libertarian Party, Joe Jorgensen is a compromise for me. I'm talking yeah. to, uh, you know, I'm talking to the candidate that I supported right here, right now. So make sure everybody understands that. Um, oh, thank and, you, Adam. No, no, and I, I, if I may on that, I, I, man, that's bringing back the Ron Paul days. Because you remember when Ron Paul <laughs> lost the primary and the Republicans were looking at the Libertarian block going, well, come on. Can't you just compromise a little bit and and vote for McCain? Vote for can't you? And it's like, no, Ron Paul was the compromise yeah. that we have to have a president and this constitution that is illegal still in effect. No, yeah. that's the cop. And like we as libertarians getting behind Jorgensen and, and and Cohen, we're like, okay, if we have to have a president. Let's at least have someone who espouses voluntary ethics. We don't want to keep the system going, right? Yeah. All right. So, Adam, I don't know. Maybe there's uh, something that we we owe our audience uh, by, by way of introduction here for you. I think that's relevant to your current projects mm -hmm. and this book. Would, would you give, give our audience a reminder of, of your, your, your quick military resume? and how it led you to libertarianism and the activism that you're involved with now? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a combat veteran of the 173rd Airborne. Uh, went to Afghanistan, to the Konar province, actually. It's the Hindu Kush region along the Pakistani border. Uh, the Konar province was featured in, actually, there was a documentary made about our deployment uh, while we were there. Uh, were covered by Vanity Fair and some other uh, reporters did a documentary called Restrepo. It was actually nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, it was followed up by Corn Gall. Uh, it was the sequel to it. But so you can check those out if you're interested. It was around 2007, 2008 when I was there. I went on a 15 month deployment. But uh, yeah, when I actually, while I was still there in 2008, I had voted for Ron Paul in the Republican primary uh, and, and ballot from from the Jalalabad, Afghanistan. So but yeah, when I got back from the from the military, from my service, you know, I was honorably but medically retired for uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder. And um you know, when I got back, I was definitely in an anti-war mood. I wanted to uh, stand against the war. I, you know, Ron Paul ran again for president in 2012, and so I got involved in that grassroots effort. Uh, I had not been, um, you know, I'm not really a media guy. This is more your thing than it is mine. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a combat vet veteran, 173rd Airborne. Went to Afghanistan for a 15-month deployment, 2007-2008. Uh, um, the deployment was actually covered in the media. They did a documentary called Restrepo uh, about our deployment there um, and followed up with a sequel called Korngal. And uh, it looks like I just dropped out again, or did I? No, you're good. Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, I uh, I was I, I voted for Ron Paul in 2008 from Jalalabad, Afghanistan. And, um, you know, I, I uh, came back. I was medically retired for post-traumatic stress disorder when I got back. 
And uh, of course, Ron Paul ran again in 2012. And so somebody had asked uh, about doing a combat veterans for Ron Paul podcast. You know, obviously Ron Paul was always, his name was kind of slandered as, as an isolationist, but we know he was not an isolationist. He's a non-interventionist. And I thought the non-interventionist foreign policy angle was extremely important at the time. And uh, so, you know, I stepped up and when I was asked and did the CVRP podcast for a little while, but it's, it's not really my forte. You know, you're, you're the media guy, Adam, this is really your expertise. Uh, but I'm out there, you know, all these years, I've not really been doing a lot of media stuff but here lately. I've, I've done a little bit again because, you know, same as when I did the CVRP thing, I just think a, I have a sense of urgency right now that there's things that definitely need to be addressed. So, um, it's one of the things that links us, right? I mean, we we met each other at the uh, the Ron Paul March on the White House back in 2012. I mean, that was such an awesome effort that you worked on uh, and other people worked on to to be able to stand up for peace and and to stand against the war the warfare state uh, during Obama's administration. And and uh, you know, I. Uh, I, I, I want to say, you know, I don't want to start getting too far into the weeds just yet, but I want to say, Adam, I I feel like there's, you know, some things going on right now that, that beckon back to that time, um, you know, when we're talking mm. about being anti-war, uh, uh, you know, w- when I say I'm anti-war, I mean, I'm anti-war. I, I'm not just anti-war for when there's a drumbeat to send American soldiers overseas. Guess what? I'm also against civil war. And and uh, and I think all libertarians should be. And just as much as we would expect the anti-war left and the anti-war right and anti-war everybody else to stand up when our government and our media is starting for uh, the drum for a foreign war, I think we should, you know, as anti-war people, we should be standing up right now and promoting peace here in the homeland as well. You know, I really got uh, really got something in my crawl against uh, Donald Trump and Tom Cotton and these guys uh, back after right after George Floyd was killed. They started uh, advocating for deploying federal combat troops here in in the homeland here domestically against our own American citizens on our own soil, you know, against protesters. You know, it, it reminds me of the the same way that we beat the war drum about going into other countries. There's some a little scuffle that goes on, and so we end up sending in advisors, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And these guys go in, and they they basically are just force multipliers that go in and and put together kind of a makeshift militia type of situation, and they stir the shit up some more. And then you know, next thing you know, the media is talking about, hey. There's all this stuff going on in this foreign country and, you know, we're going to have to invade now. And so we we see this mission creep until we eventually end up deploying, you know, the full mass of, of military power into another country. And what I'm scared of right now is the mission creep of the, the war on terror uh, here in the United States. You know, right after George Floyd was killed uh, within a couple of days. Uh, Donald Trump sent out two tweets. One of them was uh, advocating for domestically deploying federal combat troops. And the other one was saying that he mm-hmm. wanted to designate Antifa as a, a domestic terrorist organization. Never mind that he doesn't have the authority to do that to begin with. Uh, and even if he does do it, it's, it doesn't really carry weight. But what I'm concerned about is that it's just a pretext for Uh, you know, building on the precedent of the previous presidents that we've had since the war on terror as well, and expanding those military war powers that have kind of been more reserved for overseas and bringing that all right back here to the homeland. I went into a long detail uh, on uh, Aquarian Anarchy with Marcus Pulis and them guys the, the other night, but in a nutshell, you know, what I think I see happening right now is that regardless of whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden is elected this uh, this election, either one would be a disaster. 
uh, I believe if, if Trump is elected, he's immediately going to put down this protest movement with an iron fist. And the, the, the weight of the police state is going to be really, really heavy on this whole country. Uh, I think if, if Joe Biden gets elected, I think they're a little more apt to kind of um, try to placate and pander a little bit that, you know, and they're just going to they're just going to reform around the edges a little bit. You know, I, I said this the other day after Ice Cube tweeted out and said that uh, he says, I told you what they was going to do calm you down, hear you out, and give you nothing. And, you know, this is a protest movement, mind you. They have legitimate grievances. So, you know, all the other, like, uh, the militant Antifa, the, the people who are uh, engaged in looting, engaged in property destruction, and, and all the, the destructive things like that, I don't want to minimize that. That is a problem. And, 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 you know, that, that, that is something that I don't support and don't think we should support at all. But what, what I, what I think when we look at this protest, I think we have to understand given the history of the police state, uh, the mission creep of the war on terror into our police state and the, the history of systemic racism that does exist within the police state it's all kind of come to a head right now. And I think that's why after George Floyd, it wasn't just black people, but white people, Chinese, you know, it's like all of us brown people too. We all poured out into the streets and started protesting because we do understand that there are legitimate grievances with this protest movement. So, so Adam, my, it, it, well, one, one of the things that I've oh, I appreciated about your perspective is that you, you share my general long-term optimism, but perhaps with a more peaceful, grounded view of things. And to hear you take this sort of doom and gloom analysis is, is a little discouraging. Not that I disagree with anything that you've said, <clears throat> but then I would have to follow up with how much of a step backwards does this represent? And do you fear, or for, does this in any way challenge your long-term optimism uh, or even your mid-term optimism? Do you see any of these negative dynamics that we're experiencing right now turning into sort of bigger, more endearing or enduring steps backwards for humanity or in America? I, the, the only honest answer I have for that is I don't know. I, I just, I don't, you know, there's... There's a lot of there's a lot of people that's more than happy to throw predictions and prophecies out there and stuff. You know, I thought I could predict things a time or two. And, and uh, you know, like I got blindsided when Donald Trump got elected. So I think a lot of people did. But, but really, to answer your question, though, um, you know, it, it is kind of a, a, a dark forecast, a, a view of what's going on right now. But what, what, what the point that I really want to get to is that I just want the American people to understand that this is a legitimate protest movement. And regardless of what happens in the next few months, in the next few years, uh, I, I just want to make sure that we don't allow D.C. and the media to turn the narrative and turn the, the whole country against the protest movement and therefore have nothing else standing in the way to just come down with, with an iron fist, just to put the boot on the neck. So, you know, what I think should be done, you know, if, if we had, if we had any real leadership in DC, I think the first thing we would have done when this protest movement kicked off is in qualified immunity. You know, because as long as qualified immunity exists, the police are literally above the law. And as long as you have a class of people like that who are literally above the law, uh, there is no such thing as rule of law. Law and order and rule of law is just an authoritarian talking point. You know, even in the United States Constitution, we have the Equal Protection and Representation Clause. Uh, everybody has to be on the same uh, equal footing under the law for there to be any real semblance of the rule of law. So I, what I think this really is, though, is it provides an opportunity for us as libertarians as well. Right. We don't have to 
try to pander to the left. We don't have to try to pander to the right, you know, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. We don't have to do any of that right now as libertarians. So, so here's the, here's the optimistic part of it, Adam. Here's, here's the positive part of it. I think we're, 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 uh, offered an opportunity right now where as libertarians, all we have to do is drill down on our first principles and charge straight ahead. We, we don't have to pander left or right, just charge straight ahead with our first principles and people are going to follow that. Um, first principles resonate with people. And especially in a time like this in crisis, you know, I, I, I'm often really, um, really disappointed with with young, you know, aspiring, talented activists that kind of get like they'll, they'll be doing some good work. And then all of a sudden they start to kind of take sides in that culture war thing or something. And then next thing you know, they're way off on one side or the other. And now they're back into the lesser of two evils thing again. And they're, you know, and I just I think that's a mistake, yeah, you know, walking into those culture wars and whatnot. I, I think we just drill down on our first principles and charge straight ahead at this thing. And, and yeah, I, I think there's a chance that we could make a lot of difference. And, uh, and, and, you know, look, this police state thing is, this is the libertarian wheelhouse. You no, know, we, this is something we've been concerned about. We've railed against the police state for a long time. So I think this is uh, just natural territory uh, for us to try to, you know, let our voice be part of this protest movement. Let, let us participate in it. Absolutely. So, Adam, your book, Operation Phoenix Warrior, we haven't got a chance to talk about it on the air, even though it's been out for a while. We got it out there on screen. And okay. the other thing is, like right here, I, I got to start with this. Apocalyptic, legalistic cult rearing. What's yeah. that referring to? Yeah. So I was, uh, I, I was raised, I mean, if I, if I am anything in this world, I am a product of the religious right. Uh, that's not the politics I identify or the philosophy or world I identify with anymore. Uh, uh, but that was the atmosphere that I was raised in. How you doing, Mr. House? I, I'm doing okay. I don't know how great my internet's doing. <laughs> where, what, what are you, where are you right now? I'm in Texas these days. Yeah. Oh, uh, so steers and queers aren't really good at organizing internet service companies. Okay. Uh, what, what, what just, I mean, I'm kind of curious, like, because this is something that, that I deal with here. What, uh, what's your internet service? Uh, there's a AT and T provider here, but it's, I mean, I don't have any control over it. It's where I'm living right now. I'm basically on some, uh, a system that's being shared, you know, by several different people. So, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's weird. I mean, it's it's like there's a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> maybe maybe it is. You put a couple of anti-war veterans together. Maybe that's the you know that's just too much for it. <laughs> I, I don't. Well, I don't even mean like just this right now. I shouldn't say a glitch in the matrix. I should say the matrix is getting really glitchy. Yeah. Like, is that, is that like Edge Service? Like, hey, uh, Amazon Prime is in two day delivery. It's seven day delivery now. Uh, you can get in trouble with the police for registration, but you can't go to the DMV to get your shit fixed. You know, it's like uh, th in the internet, just you, like you see weird stuff happen. And then the censorship. And then everything around Corona. Like, you can't, I can't mention Corona on a YouTube video without having to check a special box that says we're talking about controversial subjects so that YouTube can put there, well, here, don't, while this guy's saying this about Corona, don't forget you get your official CDC narrative here. And it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm sitting at home, you know, like I'm, I'm doing my best to kind of avoid things right now. Like I don't go, I, if it's if I'm not touring for activism, like I'm kind of a homebody. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know me like that. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's like this whole extra level of frustration that I can really only describe as 
a dark, shitty cloud hanging over the world right now that is this period of coronaphobia. And and that's why I'm, you know, I want to know, like I'm I'm I wanna I I'm looking ahead, going, you know, how long is this step back gonna last? But you are explaining how you are the product of the religious right of America and how that led you to the military and anti-war activism and ultimately to your book Operation Phoenix Warrior. So wherever you want to get back into that. Yeah, no, that that's fine. Yeah, it's just I, I was raised in in a, a very cultish like environment. Uh, um, you know, and this is this is this is something that a lot of people, especially here in the United States, you know, we we have some pretty dark, um, apocalyptic kind of religious stuff going into the world stuff. You know, um, anyway, it it was it was something that you know as as a as a kid. It took me a long time to really get out of it. You know, I, I eventually I've had a long evolution. I'm actually an atheist now. And when I first became uh, realized that I didn't believe in God anymore, I was really uh, I mean, my first reaction was I was scared to death because I, I thought, you know, I'd been indoctrinated all my life to believe that I was going to burn in torturous hellfire for eternity uh, for for not believing in God. Um, but then, you know, the, the thing is, I just ended up realizing that I'm a natural skeptic. That's, that's really where I begin from. And, uh, and that's how I get to atheism to begin with through, through the agnostic viewpoint. But, um, but that's really neither here nor there again, you know, I don't think the culture wars are quite as important. Uh, right now I'm more concerned about all of us standing up to the state together. And I, I think a moment like we're in right now, you talk about this dark cloud. Um, I mean, it is a dark cloud, but I think the silver lining is that uh, those of us who kind of understand or at least believe in the, the principles of liberty, um, you know, we have a moment right now where we can show that our, our principles are the way and um and that freedom is the way so i think this can be an opportunity as well you know and i mean the whole world's in realignment right now uh why wouldn't we want to be part of that conversation mm. what comes next you know i mean it's like i said i think if we had leadership in dc they would have already ended qualified immunity but you can't stop there either i think you immediately have to end no knock warrants the war on drugs you know, mandatory minimum kind of th all that stuff. N no victim, no crime. Right. But as soon as we do that to just kind of release the pressure valve for what's going on right now, because right now we're in the middle, middle of a powder keg and people are shooting each other and shit. Like, let's just relieve a little bit of that pressure. But then immediately on the heels of that, let's have a real conversation about how we can reimagine delivering the services that we want without the police, the police state the way it is right now. Uh, you know, we can go back and reimagine the whole thing if we want to. So w when we say we want police, what do we really, what are we really saying that we want? We want somebody that's like competent and trained to respond to emergency situations. Uh, maybe we want somebody who's able to track down uh, those who actually commit a real crime. I'm not talking about bullshit crime against the state. I'm talking about, you know, real crime where there's a victim and somebody's rights have been violated. Maybe we want those kinds of services, right? But that doesn't mean that we need the police state in the modern version that we have it right now. We can completely dismantle this thing and reimagine uh, how we want to deliver those services in a way that can be cheaper, uh, more effective, and more respectful of people's uh, rights and freedoms. And, you know, why not let's do that? It's, it's time right now, right? I mean, the, the world's in a reset, and I, don't, I see no time like the present to reimagine how we can deliver some of these things uh, in, in, in a, a more reasonable way, in a, in a more peaceful way. Well, getting to the, I, I think, most valuable part of your book and, and relevant part for right now is a veteran who has dealt with PTSD and other veterans with PTSD uh, and, and done work on veteran suicide. The last sentence in your blurb here says, this book is meant to comfort trauma survivors and letting them know they are not alone. 
to break social taboos regarding discussion about mental illness, provide strategies and tools for PTSD survivors, and to share a vision about a role for martial arts as a therapy for PTSD. Given that we are seeing a, an unprecedented spike in suicides right now in response to the corona lockdowns, the added stress and isolation that goes along with that for so many people, uh, what, what would you say to veterans who are struggling with isolation right now? One of the things, uh, the same thing I've been beating the drum on for years is you have to stay self-motivated and you have to find what works for you. So this, this is why I, I rarely ever take a, a side for or against any particular therapy. Uh, I say it's more like a shotgun scatter. You know, you, you, you throw it all against the wall and you see what, what works for you. Um, you know, try everything. Uh, dip your toes in. So if, if there's pharmaceuticals that work for you, then that's great. You know, find the right concoction of pharmaceuticals that works for you. But, you know, I've, I think, you know, one of the things that people like us that's been paying attention to this for a while, Adam, we, we, we realize that just a pharmaceutical cocktail can't be the whole answer. And, you know, would really rather prefer uh, to get away from the, the, the uh, pharmaceutical cocktails and and do other things uh try try other methods other strategies uh you know come up with outlets and coping mechanisms that work for you as an individual um you know training martial arts is definitely one of the things that's worked for me uh i got into it a whole lot more than i even thought that i would and uh i mean ended up living over in thailand for a few years and and training full time and getting my license to teach Muay Thai. So now anywhere I go in the world, uh, the Thai government considers me a Muay Thai school. So I can just teach anywhere I want. And, uh, and my students are accredited um, as uh, recognized by the Thai uh, Department of Education. But anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I got back from Thailand and it wasn't very long. You know, I had just enough time to start my school and I got about two and a half months into my school. I built a small class and uh, that's when the first lockdown started. So um, I was supporting my school out of my personal income and I, I couldn't continue to do that. So as it stands right now, my school is closed indefinitely. Um, I also had to have surgery this summer, a pretty major surgery. So that's set me back personally uh, for the last few months. But, you know, ultimately the idea is that uh, what I really want to do is end up hosting seminars, uh, you know, camps, training camps. And, and what I, I, one of the things I really envision is being able to take a group of people who suffer from post-traumatic stress and be able to introduce them to uh, to Muay Thai and be able to do it in a camp atmosphere, you know, like where you come away from your daily routine, the, the, the uh, uh, whatever's got you bogged down in a rut and and come together with a bunch of other people who are struggling with the same thing and challenge yourself, you know, challenge yourself and work on both your mental and your physical health. Obviously, we know when you're active, uh, that has good consequences for your psychology as well. So uh, basically, yeah, for me, I definitely want to pursue uh, trying to use methods like martial arts as good outlets. Uh, but ultimately, what I say is find what works for you. Not the same thing is going to work for everybody. We're, we're all individuals. We have different personalities different wants and needs, whatever. You got to find what works for you and stay motivated because nobody can do it for you. Excellent. Well said. Your YouTube channel is on Liberty and uh, we can get that up here on screen as well. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Anything else you need people to know about how to connect with you? No, I, I just uh, I appreciate you having me back. Uh, I hate that we had some connectivity issues, but it's it's good to see you again, my my home front battle buddy. And 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 I just one thing real quick, Adam, I've got to say thank you because I have you know I I do keep I don't always watch every episode of your show all the way through, you know, but I do do keep you in rotation. 
and uh, and your social media and all that as well. And I can tell that that you have a, a fidelity to first principles. All these years, I mean, we we're all human, right? We all have faults or whatever. But as far as I can tell, you've always been a principled volunteerist. Uh, you run on the presidential platform that I believe in, which is the platform of abolition. And uh, and, and I just want to say thanks for for being out there and staying true to first principles, man. Keep it up. And so uh, cub, cup, kum cup. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Adam. By the way, uh, if, if we, we got to talk about you getting back out here to Gardenia. We, we have some exciting possibilities with what we could be doing with uh, veterans retreats out here. So. Keep you posted. We'll, we'll talk offline after the show. I'm going to text you again. All right. Thanks.